Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This week, we are moving on to Nintendo Power, issue number 22, for March of 1991, and we are approaching the end of Nintendo Power's third year. We've got a bunch of ground to cover this issue, including this, the nominees for the 1991 Nestor Awards, the third annual awards. So, let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Metal Storm. The art itself is a diorama with a kit-bashed version of the game's giant robot. The robot itself looks great, and from a sheer craft side, side of things, it's probably one of the magazine's best crafted covers thus far, even kind of a bit better than last issue's Star Tropics cover. I'd love to figure out how the robot itself was made, as I don't think there were any model kits made in Japan of the robot from Metal Storm. This issue's letters column features the Nintendo Wrap, which I won't replicate for you here, in part that I don't have anybody to give me a beat, so I'll probably end up shifting off tempo. Anyway, I will say, though, that there are far too many yo's in that last line of the rap. You should have, like, maximum three, maybe four yo's. Any more than that, it just gets silly. Irem has Metal Storm, a action platformer with a novel game mechanic, the ability to reverse gravity so you can cling to the top or bottom of the screen to get past obstacles. The game also uses a password-based continue system, which means that, well, if you're using a password, then you can eventually reverse engineer it so you can start the first level with all of the lies and all of the power-ups and that sort of thing. And indeed, that ha the password has been reverse engineered, and if you go to game FAQs, you can find out how to clutch it and make it do whatever you want it to. Anywho, in the guide itself, we get maps of the game's levels through Stage 6. Now, I've reviewed Metal Storm once before, back when I was doing this as a series of text articles on my blog. And I enjoyed it then, and I enjoy it now. It's important to say that Metal Storm, while it is an action platformer, it is not a run-and-gun game like Contra. You don't play it that way, you shouldn't play it that way. It's both more precise and more imprecise than that game is. The way the game's controls work is that the A button, which controls jumping, serves all double duty as the gravity reverse button. Uh, holding it down certain degrees, or whether light taps or moderate holds, will determine how long you jump, but if you hold the jump button and press the direction of the relative ceiling, the gravity reverses, not just for you, but also for some enemies as well. This leads to some intricately interestingly designed jumping puzzles, where you have to, rather than doing bunches of short jumps, you have to do a, a series of carefully timed uh, gravity flips. The difficulty of this is somewhat adjusted by the fact that while the game doesn't give you bottomless pits, it does give you situations where you can accidentally jump or gravity switch into some spikes or an enemy, and normally you can be killed by one hit, though there are power-ups that will give you a shield that lets you take an additional hit. Now, if the levels were designed poorly, this would be a real problem, but the levels aren't. They are very carefully designed so that once you learn the levels and the timing, you can beat them without too many problems, but even if you're approaching the levels for the first time, you can still make your way through them if you're careful. To put it another way, trial it's not totally trial and error gameplay because it doesn't require memorization to let you complete the levels, but learning the levels certainly helps. This issue, Howard and Nestor are playing Star Tropics and trying to figure out how to get the subsea to submerge. Howard goes looking for the code, while Nestor uses a more hands-on approach. Speaking of Star Tropics, the guide to Star Tropics continues with a look at chapters 3 through 6 of the game, which takes us right to the part with the aliens. Yes, aliens. So, the Legend of Zelda comparison I made last episode wasn't entirely accurate. Yes, this game is played from a top-down perspective, like Legend of Zelda. Yes, there are puzzles in the dungeons, like The Legend of Zelda. However, unlike The Legend of Zelda, you're not using items you find in your travel to unlock new areas of dungeons. Instead, you're using them to defeat more dangerous enemies, particularly bosses. This kind of actually makes the game slightly closer to a certain degree to, like, Crystallis or maybe the Ease series of games. Except you don't directly level up, like with those games. 
Star Tropics has a few other problems. I don't catch this on camera here, but the game likes to throw some really cheap deaths at you. From dead ends in dungeons that will insta-kill you, to some obnoxious sinking platforms that come kind of out of nowhere. Additionally, there is one puzzle that requires you to have the game's documentation to complete, or would have required the game's documentation in the days before the internet. It is possible to overcome this now, but it's still something of a pain in the neck, as it's something that, if you have an incomplete copy of the game, makes the game literally impossible to complete without the use of an FAQ or a whole bunch of time spent doing trial and error. That said, is the game bad? No. Putting aside any slowdown that you might see in this video due to hardware problems on my end, the game controls incredibly well, everything moves silky smooth. The game uses tall sprites like isometric games do, but without the problems those games have of not recognizing where the character's feet are and, and having some false hits because of this. I enjoyed this game a lot, and I'm considering this to be a strong contender for this issue's pick. In classified information, we have a lot of Mega Man 3 tips this issue, particularly on which weapons are most effective against which robot masters, which in turn gives you a few alternate starting places for your path through defeating all the robot masters. Next is Adventure Island 2, and Master Higgins is back. The new game features several new animal companions for Higgins, each with their own special abilities, and the guide gives maps for several of the courses on the first island you go through in the game for an island, along with some notes on the following seven islands. Adventure Island 2 is a much better game than the first one. The difficulty for the levels is a little simpler, and you get a wide, wider variety of helpful power-ups, and in turn the game also lets you move backwards in the levels, letting you backtrack as needed to get power-ups that you might otherwise have missed because you're moving too fast, or just otherwise lets you set up jumps. The controls are also a little tighter and more responsive than they were before, particularly the jumping. The companion monsters are helpful and generally useful. Almost each one has a useful attack, and they also let you take another hit during levels. And the ones which don't have useful attacks have some sort of useful traversal ability that makes the levels a little easier, whether it's letting you swim underwater, or letting you basically fly and bypass most of the enemies in the level. Um, additionally, when a new monster is collected over the course of a level when you already have a monster, your old monster is stocked in an egg so you can use it later, rather than you losing your current monster. However, the way the eggplant works has been changed. Before, when you collected an eggplant, it showed up as just another fruit, and you could just see it and avoid it fairly easily. Here, the eggplant is hidden in a egg, and it follows you around like the fairy, except instead of letting you take an, instead of letting you be inv invulnerable, it instead drains your time more rapidly while you're going along. Additionally, because it is in an egg, as opposed to just being a normal, you know, fruit, it's not just harder to avoid because you can't see it coming. The egg has a larger box, so it's much more difficult to jump over it or otherwise avoid it. So, it's a double factor of it's an unpleasant surprise, which makes beating levels more difficult. It's also something that you, can, that you can't really avoid, in, even if you know it's coming and you're trying to be careful. Next up, we move into the Game Boy games with Operation C, a Contra game for the Game Boy, and we get notes on the first five levels of the game. Now, Game Boy versions of NES games can be hit or miss. Sprites can be either too small or worse, too large, making it hard to tell where you're going and what enemies are approaching on the too large front, or too small, meaning that you don't really have much sense of character for the characters and enemies in the game. You just assume, oh, that small blob is kind of mushroom-shaped, so therefore it's a Goomba, for example, in the case of Super, uh, Super Mario World. Uh, Super Mario World, Super Mario Land, the first one. Fortunately, Operation C doesn't have either of those problems. All the characters are just the right size, where you get the, the field of view that you expect from a Contra game, but you still feel get the vibe of the characters uh, of the Contra. 
It also plays almost exactly like Contra, except with a normally smaller screen. The controls work just as well as the controls with Contra. It's just as easy to shoot as an, at an angle as you would at Contra, or jump up and shoot straight down. Um, additionally, while the weapon selection is reduced from Contra and Super C, the game makes up for it by making the three weapons that are available better. You have a spread shot, a wider shot, um, which is meant to be the flamethrower, which takes up a large portion of the screen, and a homing shot, which works as a spread shot normally, but then whenever any enemies are home show up on screen, all the bullets home in on that enemy, making it easier to drop opponents really quick. This is, frankly, a really solid Game Boy game, and one that's certainly worth picking up if you find a copy. Next up is the sequel to A Boy and His Blob for the Game Boy, with a map of the fairly expansive first level. This game is utterly abysmal. This game has all of the problems the first game had with convoluted and unclear logic, or a lack thereof, with the design of the game's levels being too large for the Game Boy the screen, combined with a lack of a map to help you tell where you are, and additionally, it has a whole bunch of other obnoxious problems in there. First, when you hold down the D-pad to move, you pick up speed, and then skid to a stop like you're on ice. This makes precise maneuvering difficult unless you're tapping the D-pad, and you need to have some precise maneuvering of both yourself and the blob when you are making your way through certain areas. Additionally, you have a limited supply of deli be jelly beans, which means there are situations where, by accidentally tapping on the A button, which throws jelly beans, if they're, they're jumping in this game, in spite of the fact that it's doing the, keeping with the logic of A jumps, B shoots, jelly bean throwing should be B, and call the blob should be A. Anyway, you could render this game completely impossible to complete just by getting accustomed to the controls. Further, the game adds death traps that come almost entirely out of the blue, such as torches that turn into spear traps. Were this an NES game, which is honestly a format which works better for long and involved levels and convoluted puzzles, I might cut this game some slack. I still wouldn't like it, but I'd cut it some slack. But this is a Game Boy game designed for a system you're meant to use on the bus or train or while sitting in and waiting in a waiting room somewhere doctor's office, DMV, whatever, so this game has no excuse. Don't play this game. To wrap up the Game Boy section, in the Game Boy Classified Information column, we get a tip on how to grind for 1-ups in Castlevania The Adventure. We move to the more informative content with a look at the guts of the NES with the Inside the NES article, which, surprise surprise, discusses all the inner workings of that system along with the Game Boy. So I mentioned last time I discussed the problems with the front loader NES, and at the time I was thinking, oh, I'll wait until the top loader is introduced and discuss it then, but now is as good a time as any. The Japanese Famicom was a top loading system, where you had smaller cartridges in terms of height that fit in the top of the system, much like the Super Nintendo that would come later, and the Sega Genesis, which is already out. This allowed the connector for the cartridges to have a very strong connection with the system's main board. The cartridges go on the top, and you push a button to get the cartridges out, or just kind of gently pull them straight out. Simple. However, when the NES was launching in the U.S., and I think I've discussed this earlier with um, the discussion of Rob back in the Nintendo Fun Club News episodes, uh, the video game crash was fresh in the memory of retailers, and thus they were gun-shy about stocking another video game system considering that they got burned kind of bad on the last three. So Nintendo kind of used a two-phase plan, or two-factor plan, to ease retailer subscription, uh, suspicions. Part one was Rob, the robotic operating buddy, buddy which I discussed back when I was covering Fun Club News. It's a... It, it, make, it basically is a peripheral that makes the system look like a normal toy, sort of like Teddy Ruxpin, which actually leads into the part about not making the system a top loader. Or at least a system where you don't have a visible cartridge sticking out. The Atari 2600 and ColecoVision were top loaders, and the Intellivision was a side loader, but it still had a visible cartridge sticking out of the system. The NES is basically, if you look at it, kind of like a VCR. If you ever looked inside your VCR, inside the slot when you put a tape in, for those of you who are old enough to have used VCRs, 
you stuck the, the tape in, it got pulled inside and then went down, where while the tape, the magnetic tape inside of the, the cassette was read through the magnetic read-write heads. Um, and so, and the NES works the same way, sort of. You push it in, you, it doesn't automatically pull it in, and then you press it down to engage the contacts and set up that it's working and get it to read. Um, so it sort of fools the retailers into thinking, oh, this isn't a game system, per se. This is a toy with a peripheral that lets it do things. Um, this leads kind of to the problems, because there's more things that can fail here. You have um, a flexible bit, a bending bit that's vital to the system that's vital to the system, which is the connector from the pins, um, or the, the, the basically cables from the pins on the, where, where the cartridge goes in, to the uh, motherboard. So that bends, and if it bends, it can break. Um, or otherwise have, lose connection problems. Particularly since with the NES, when you're pulling the cartridge out, you couldn't necessarily just pull it straight out. Um, easily. You would have to wiggle it out, which again, gives, leads to opportunities where contact could break. Additionally, for the system to work, the sensor had to recognize that, the, or the sensor in there had to recognize that, oh, the system is in the down position. Um, now this is in part to make, to keep people from pulling the cartridge out while playing, but still, it's another thing where the system could go wrong. Now, when we got the top loader later, um, that fixes a lot of these. We now have a, a vertical um, connection, which basically means the cartridge is now perpendicular to the motherboard. And also, because of this, it's easier to pull the cartridges out when you want to swap out games and play something else. Um, really fixes a lot of problems. Uh, but still, we're not there yet. We still have the front-loading NES, and this is probably the reason why you'd have contacts getting fouled, why you'd have to kind of blow inside or blow on the cartridge, or why people thought that that would fix the problem. Kind of did, kind of did, not really. Um, all that sorts of happy, fun times. Now, did the illusion that with these two phases that the um, NES was not actually a game, game system last? No, of course it didn't. But it didn't need to. All it really needed to do is last just long enough to get people buying the NES and buying games for it, at which point the retailers wouldn't really care. They're getting money, and they're happy getting their money, thank you very much. Even if they had been, like, really fooled, by the time that they would have figured it out, they're getting paid, and they probably much prefer the money than just, you know, stopping carrying the system just to spite Nintendo. Getting back to games, Taxan has a G.I. Joe licensed video game based on the toy line of the animated series, and we have tips on missions 1 through 6. The game also wraps around after you've beaten it, so you can go back through the game again at a harder difficulty. I'm kind of curious over whether you get a new ending after the second and third times that you beat the game. Now, G.I. Joe is an interesting game. It's a sort of team-based run-and-gun game. Well, kind of like Contra, but with the ability to swap between different characters with different abilities. Each mission, you assemble a team of three Joes, each with different attributes, and set out to complete a series of levels on each mission. The attributes of each Joe determine how high they can jump, how much damage their weapons do, both in hand-to-hand -hand with range attacks, and how much health they have. Conceptually, this is a great way to do a G.I. Joe game. It allows each character to have abilities that reflect their toy or character of the show and gives you basically a big toy box of Joes to play with as you go through the game. In practice though, the execution doesn't quite work. The main reason why is due to a few little problems. For example, the game has an odd habit of making dropped power-ups and health refills bounce away rather than just falling. This makes it hard to, say, switch to a character who needs a health refill when one drops, because you then need to go chase the health refill. Further, your team's health doesn't refill in between levels, 
or chunks of a mission, which also complicates things, particularly as you get further in the game and you run into more difficult level bosses. At those points, you need more resources at your disposal, particularly health, and if you haven't been able to refill your health due to the refills bouncing away from you, you're kind of in trouble. Consequently, G.I. Joe feels like a game that, while playable, would be more playable with the use of a cheap device like the Game Genie. In the Now Playing column, we have a look at a new strategy game from Koei with Bandit Kings of Ancient China, which is basically kind of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, but with the Bandit Kings of Ancient China and the Mongols and that sort of thing. Next up is Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom, which kind of looks like my first visual novel. Well, it is my first visual novel. This is a very basic, very simple adventure game with no death penalty, and which is a very job at creating an interesting world to explore with some decent character and flair, with the added bonus of, unlike other adventure games on PCs, there's no real sense of, of pixel bitching, of having to look for the one spot in the level environment to click on or tap on or search or whatever to find what you need to proceed with the quest, like what you have with some of the ICOM adventure games like um, like Shadowgate and like Deja Vu. Now, as for why this game is a cult hit as opposed to something that could have gotten but it could be more successful and led to more visual novels coming out in the U.S., like, for example, Portopia Murders. Well, honestly, I had heard of this game when I was younger, because I, when I was younger, I was reading issues of Nintendo Power from the library, and I gotta say, the game's use of talking vegetables made me think this game was for younger kids than I was at the time, which was, like, eight. So, I thought it was for people younger than me. Audiences, like, at the Sesame Street... The, the, the early Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood or nowadays Teletubbies or Barney level. In retrospect, the perfect the difficulty would have been perfect for eight-year-olds, both in terms of reading level and in terms of puzzles that require a certain degree of imagination and intuitive leap, but nothing super spectacular, just kind of think about it a little bit. Um, but the use of talking vegetables makes it look like something on par with the Sesame Street games. It is a game that I would say was worth playing, but people looking for a sort of deep adventure game challenge or a narrative on par with Portopia Murders or what, or what have you will probably be disappointed. Well, as we're approaching the end of the year, it is time for the Nintendo Power Awards and our list of nominees. My picks for the awards are For Graphics and Sound, Castlevania 3. For Theme and Fun, Dragon Warrior 2, which I should mention hasn't gotten any coverage yet. For Challenge, Castlevania 3, for Play Control, Mega Man 3, Best Hero, Mega Man, for Best Villain, The Koopalings, for Most Innovative, The Miracle Piano Keyboard System, for Best Multiplayer, Gauntlet 2, for Best NES Game, Super Mario Bros. 3, and for Best Game Boy Game, Final Fantasy Legend. As far as which ones win... Well, we'll have to find out next issue. In Counselor's Corner, we have some questions on how to get out of the dungeon in Maniac Mansion, as well as some additional questions on how to find each of the crests rather, in Dragon Warrior 2. In the top 30, Metroid, Punch-Out, now with 100% less Mike Tyson, and Rad Racer have re-entered the list. In Celeb Profile, we have a look at Rain Pryor, the daughter of stand-up comedian Richard Pryor, and, at this time, star of the ABC sitcom Head of the Class. Well, since we're doing the Where Are They Now thing, um, Miss Pryor was most recently in the Game Change um, docudrama on HBO in a minor role. She'd also previously been on the Showtime series Rude Awakening, which was a kind of... Uh, prison show, uh, drama, as opposed to a comedy, um, among a bunch of smaller roles, uh, but she, she's still working. In Pack Watch, we have a look at Power Blade, which is going to be featured next issue, along with more issue on info on Star Wars. Uh, next, Swinter CES has come and gone, and we get some review notes on what was covered at CES. A particular note is The Ultimate Warrior was at Acclaim's booth, promoting the next WrestleMania game. 
Um, and Trade West was showing Battletoads. Uh, finally, we wrap this issue up with the Super NES Showcase. The Super Family Com has now gotten its U.S. name, the Super NES, which isn't really that surprising. Um, and we get a look at some of the already released Japanese titles, including Act Razor and Gradius 3. We also get a look at Final Fight, which for some reason is listed as Street Fighter. Huh. For my picks of the issue, we have no two-player games this issue, so that part's pretty straightforward. No picks. On the Game Boy front, there are only two games for the Game Boy covered this issue, and only one of them is any good, Operation C. It's everything I expect in a Contra game, but in a more portable fashion. While I prefer if it had some sort of password option, the game does have a level selection sheet, so there's that. On the NES side, we've got a few good titles this issue. Star Tropics and Metal Storm are both fantastic games. So, I'm going to recommend both with caveats. If you still have quick gaming reflexes and a responsive controller, go with Metal Storm if you can find an a affordable copy, whether at your local independent game store or what have you, um, or online or on eBay, or at your local retro gaming convention, whatever. If your reflexes have been slowing down a little, or you prefer something a little more... Uh, puzzle-based, go with Star Tropics. Either way, you won't be disappointed. Next issue, we'll get the results of the third annual Nestor Awards, and my thoughts on those results. Now, if you enjoyed this show, please give the video a thumbs up down below, and subscribe to the channel if you want to know when the next episode comes out. Also, if you want to support the show, please pledge to my Patreon. There's a URL below in the show notes, and if you're watching this on my YouTube channel page, up over in the upper r upper uh, right. Yeah. One of these days I'll figure out which direction to point. So, pledging will help me get episodes a little sooner, and it will help me improve my production quality. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.